My name is Nick Thomas Simmons. I'm the Member of Parliament for Torvine and the Chair of the Aniram Bevan Society. Welcome to the latest of my interviews with former leaders of the Labour Party on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the National Health Service. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Tony Blair, who became leader of the Labour Party in 1994 and was Prime Minister from 1997 to 2007. Tony, welcome and great to see you. Thanks, Dick. Well, I want to just start, Tony, with your 1997 Labour Party conference speech after that landslide election victory uh, in the May. And you mentioned, looking at Labour history, that three of your heroes were Clement Attlee, Ernest Bevin and Aniram Bevan. And I wondered really why you'd chosen Bevan as part of that trio. Nye Bevan was the the passion behind the creation of the National Health Service. You, you, you had all sorts of technical things that had to be got right and legislation, but he had the passion to present the case for the National Health Service in a way that the country got behind. And he had the, the negotiating skill to outwit the British Medical Association, which at the time was opposed to the, the health service. And every great um, reforming act needs, along with its technicians, its passionate advocate, and that's what he was, and that's why he'll rightly be remembered as probably the, the most significant architect of the reform. When you came into politics, Tony, as the MP for Sedgefield in 1983, at a time when Margaret Thatcher's Conservative government was making substantial changes to the National Health Service, including, for example, the internal market, which came in the late 1980s. How do you reflect on Labour's opposition to those changes during that period? For the Labour Party, we were obviously keen to defend the National Health Service from a Tory attack. We didn't really believe the Tories valued the Health Service properly or were prepared to... to um, to support it. In fact, we thought, I think with some justification, that there were elements of the Conservative Party on the right who really felt if they could get away with it, you know, they would get rid of the health service. Now, I do think that, and this then echoed down the, the years, that we tended to conflate the underfunding of the health service with defending the status quo within the health service when, you know, frankly, all organisations should change and adapt as time goes on. And um, so we were completely opposed to the internal market and the health service, but I think that was because we, you know, frankly, anything the Tories were going to be proposing, we were likely to oppose at that moment. Um, but, you know, there were also good objective reasons. For, for being opposed to, to what they were doing. He became leader of the party in 1994. And I've actually interviewed two of your uh, shadow health secretaries of that period, actually, Margaret Beckett and Harriet Harman. And we spoke about the problems that the NHS faced in that period before Labour came to power in 1997. And funding was at the forefront then, wasn't it? Funding was it was a huge problem before we came to power because we were spending, I mean, if you compared it, for example, with the United States in terms of, of spending as a proportion of, our, of the country's income, uh, you know, we, we were really low down in the, in the rankings. And the fact is, as a result of the underfunding, we had long waiting lists, uh, doctors and nurses were under tremendous pressure, and we weren't really making the changes in the health service that we needed to make. So it was clear from, I would say, pretty much from the beginning that when we came into office in 1997, one of the big challenges we would have is how, do we, how would we raise the funding of the health service and you know, ensure that we at least started to come roughly more into line with where the, the, the middle of the rankings would be in Europe at least. I think we were committed as a as Labour Party to the Tory spending plans for the first two years of your first government. But then you made a commitment, which I think, if I recollect correctly, was on a Breakfast with Frost show, about raising NHS spending to the European average. How, how did that come about? In my first 
two years or so, um, you know, we were making some changes. We put extra money in, even though we kept the government's spending programs. But I became more and more clear and talking, I was spending a lot of time out on the front line talking to doctors, nurses, and administrators for the health service. And I realized there was the need also for significant reform within the health service. You know, that we needed, we needed if we were gonna get waiting lists down sustainably and improve patient outcomes, we need also to be making changes that gave, put the patient more at the center of, of, of things. And, you know, the funding, whilst it remained underfunded, then it was very hard to get support for or to drive through reform because the funding was the thing people were concerned about. So I conceived really at that time um, of the necessity of putting together a reform program, which Alan Milburn helped put together as health secretary, combined with a significant uplift in funding so that as we came out of the initial period in government and, and came free of the, our commitment to keep to the two, year, two years of, of spending limits, that we were getting those extra resources for the health service that then allowed us to say to people, look, we're not just going to have to put in more money, we're going to have to make changes. And that was where the health service plan of the year 2000 came out of and, and really was, you know, at that point, probably the most radical plan for the health service since, since frankly, it was founded. And in 2002, there was, of course, the national insurance rise to fund the NHS. Did you think that at that point you had perhaps got within touching distance of a political consensus about increased funding for the NHS that actually came through that additional NI contribution? Yes, I think when, when we came to do the national insurance rise and it was clear this was going to the health service and it was clear also we were going to drive value for money and reform and change through the health service, then I think we, we created a coalition of those that recognised that the health service obviously needed more spending, but those who were also perhaps more on the centre-right of politics who would say, OK, but if you're going to put the money in, you've got to make the changes to make the money go further and work for people. So I think we, that was the first, that was the start, if you like, of us creating a coalition for the modernization of the health service, which had investment and reform going together. And in terms of the reform agenda, there were two perhaps more controversial aspects I was just like to ask you about. Firstly, in terms of foundation hospitals, in other words, the ability of a hospital to be independent, to set its own budget and, and, and mm -hmm. so on. And the private finance initiative where you have private finance that enables you to build new hospitals, but the money has to be paid back over time. How do you reflect back now on those two? Policies. Well, I think they're different. I mean, foundation hospitals and the ability of hospitals to set their own budgets. I mean, I think this is part of the change that, that's happened around the world and in the, in the public sector. And I think additional reforms and changes we made, patient choice, you know, um, commitments to the delivery of certain health targets and so on, uh, making sure, for example, that there are alternative, if you, if you needed to go and get something done privately but paid for by the NHS, that this was a justifiable way of ensuring we got waiting lists down. Um, so I think that all worked well. I think with private finance initiative, I mean, first of all, I don't think we would have ever got the big hospital building program without it. But I do think in the era of very low interest rates, the, the finances have shifted. I mean, all I'd say is there are sometimes very exaggerated things said about how much of the the, the bill for the health service is PFI, it really is often much less than people think. And realistically, you know, what we were doing was changing from an old system where when you built something in the public sector, it was often over time and over budget. And, you know, we did actually deliver those programs through PFI on time. But, you know, I'm aware you know, there's a controversy about it now, I think. Um, the only thing I'd say is I think there's a case for reforming it. I, I would be very hesitant in getting rid of it. The other aspect of management of the NHS that I know you were very keen on was targets. 
particularly because, of course, waiting lists were extremely long when yeah. Labour came to power in 1997. How important are targets, do you think, in managing the NHS? Well, I think targets are important in, in, in any walk of life, whatever you're doing, in, in the sense that if you're, if, you know, it doesn't, people often misunderstand this. If you're a public service, you're not there to make a profit. It's true. And therefore, you're not like a private sector company in that respect. But frankly, in lots of other respects, you're an organization like any other organization. You operate efficiently or inefficiently. The money spent wisely or not wisely. If you're, for example, a hospital and procuring a whole lot of routine equipment or furniture or you know, stuff for the hospital, I mean, the fact that you're a hospital rather than a private company, so what? You should be getting the best value for money that you can. And so the targets were part of a drive to make sure that if we were putting all this extra money in, the system was also being held accountable to achieve better times on accident emergency, waiting times, um, ability to see a doctor. You know, we introduced, you know, the ability to go and get a, a, a proper cancer diagnosis if there was a, a, a mm -hmm. risk of cancer. And, you know, these things were important to do. And I think a lower, you know, they're very easy to sort of parody targets. The fact is, as I say, in any walk of life, if you're putting a sum of money towards a certain goal, it's not unreasonable to say, <laughs> we need to know whether the goal's met or not. And, you know, whether you're, you know, dealing with um, Microsoft or the National Health Service, money spent should be spent sensibly. So I think, although, again, these things were controversial at the time, in the end, by the way, they, we managed to hit most of the targets. So by the time I left in 10 years' time, and people really forget this, when I first came to power, a winter health crisis was the norm, right? And even in our first couple of years, it was the norm. By the time I left, it wasn't even in the news. So, you know, it's, unfortunately, it's back in the news now, but that's, that's for the same reasons, by the way, as has happened before. But so it did, you know, I think these things, you know, change is always difficult, but they did have an impact. Looking at the future, what do you think are the big challenges for the NHS going forward? The big challenge, unquestionably, is how does the National Health Service use the major technological innovations that are going to be available to transform healthcare? And this is where the attitude that we had towards reform has got to be carried on by Labour. The one thing that will damage the National Health Service in the affections of the people is if they think that the health service is not keeping pace with the changes that are happening around the world. Now, this next generation of technology is going to revolutionize things like diagnosis, um, how patients are treated, how they can manage their own conditions, uh, how operations are performed. Um, it should allow us to get a much better balance between primary care and tertiary care. I mean, the problem we still have in tertiary care is a large number of people are in hospital that shouldn't really be in hospital. Um, they should be in forms of social care. So I think how the health service deals with these potentially revolutionary changes um, in, in technology will be one major factor. And how we also deal with issues around public health and personal responsibility for health. I mean, you know, we, we forget, but the big smoking, anti-smoking campaigns were incredibly important and they've had an impact and they, you know, you can measure the impact in the health service, by the way, and it's billions. So likewise, I think going on issues around sort of obesity, diet, exercise, personal responsibility, look after your own health, again, our technology can help you do that and track it. You know, the health service has got to be a center of innovation. That's the way to keep it. I mean, the health, you know, we always forget the National Health Service was the big act of modernization of the Labour government of the 1940s. And we've got to keep that spirit of modernization alongside the spirit of you know, the values of the health service of, of you know, having access to care irrespective of wealth. Do you think there'll still be a National Health Service in 70 years' time? 
I think so. I think so. I think, it, I think we've come to a kind of settled view in the country that the health service is an important part of our social contract. Now, I think there are people on the right who still sort of think that the National Health Service is a socialistic, <laughs> you know, monstrosity that's got to be dismantled. I think there are people who think that. I don't think they're going to get sufficient political traction. But, you know, we need to be always vigilant and always defending it. And as I say, always prepared to change it because otherwise, you know, great institutions, if they don't keep pace with the times, do end up being vulnerable. And, you know, the National Health Service is an amazing thing. My father was a, a foster child. Um, he grew up in a very poor part of, of, of Glasgow in, in Govan. And, you know, I remember him telling me of the way that they would put the money in the jar on the mantelpiece to save for the doctor's fees in case someone fell, fell ill. And, you know, we forget that this was a huge part of the anxiety that people had in their lives, often the most critical anxiety, because, you know, if they, they fell ill and they didn't have the money to pay, there was very little for them. So I think sometimes, you know, for my generation, which I guess was the first generation, I was born a few years after the health service began, and for future generations, somehow I think it's important that we remember and don't take for granted and what an enormous achievement and change the National Health Service was and how it cut out of the national life of the country millions of people what was otherwise a principal source of anxiety and, and worry. Tony Blair, thank you very much.